It's such a pleasure to give this lecture. I'm going to start in New Zealand, where I worked for 17 years. And uh, this is uh, Franz Joseph Glacier, which I'm sure most of you know it by this name. But its Maori name, uh, Ka Roi Mai Tau Hine Hukatera, is, um, translates as the Tears of Hine Hukatera. And Hine was a, um, a, a young woman who loved the mountains. She loved nothing more than uh, climbing the mountains. And her partner, uh, he, he was afraid of the mountains and in fact he'd been told that, that the gods lived there and it was best to keep clear of them. Um, but Hina persisted and, and, and convinced Taiwei, her partner, to go into the mountains with her. And uh, one day they were climbing up high in the Southern Alps and, uh, and he slipped and fell to his death. And uh, the story goes that Hine um, started to cry and her tears fell down the mountainside and they froze and they became the Franz Joseph Glacier. So here are the, the tears of, of Hine Hukatera flowing down the mountain. So we, in New Zealand, we set up time-lapse cameras to monitor how the ice is changing. So there's a scientific reason for this, but uh, it, it does evoke these, you know, the, the tears. And you can see how glaciers flow. It's a viscous, um, you know, solid flowing down, down slope, a bit like honey or something. Glacier video there is from 2014, but, um, the, the photo is one I took from an aircraft this summer in, in March, and you can see all that ice below is gone, right? So Franz Joseph Glacier, like many others, is, is retreating. Anyway, let's globalise a little bit for, for a minute. Uh, glaciers exist all over the world except for in Australia, like I said before. Uh, New Zealand has some, but they're tiny relative to the rest of the world. So the big uh, round circles to the right there show ice volume around the world. Uh, this is excluding the ice sheets in Antarctica and Greenland. It's just the mountain glaciers. So you can see the big circle to the bottom in Antarctica are all the mountain glaciers that are disconnected from the main ice sheet, but there's still more ice in Antarctica than anywhere else, even if we're talking about mountain glaciers. Uh, but there's significant ice in, in the Himalayas, uh, in uh, Arctic Canada, uh, you know, in, in the Canadian, in, sorry, um, uh, you know, Svalbard and so on. So there's a, this is where all the ice is located in the earth, right? And if we, I'll show you another simulation here. Um, this isn't my work, it's by a colleague from a Swiss glacier and you can see uh, something similar to what I just showed for New Zealand. Uh, we're getting up to the present day now. You can see there's been quite a lot of retreat, um, but in the decades right now, the ice is retreating at a rate that is much greater than even in the last century. And uh, by the end of the century, there's hardly any ice left. That's again uh, under a, um, a, a, an extreme sort of warming scenario where, where little climate change mitigation is occurring. And uh, all those big circles around the world, they lock up about half a metre, a bit less, 40 centimetres of sea level equivalent. So if all the glacier ice on Earth was to melt, then sea level would rise by about this much right, around the whole planet. It's a lot, but it's not, you know, the ice sheets have got much more. Under some different warming scenarios, 2.6, where we limit climate change to something reasonable, we get about sort of 15, 4 to 16 uh, centimetres of sea level rise, and it's approximately double that for an unmitigated um, climate change. This is just the, just the glacier component. Right, so glaciers melting cause sea level rise, and the amount that occurs is going to depend on what we do as, as humans from now on. Something really interesting has happened just over the last decade or so that's taken me by surprise, and that's rather than just having glaciers that are receding up the mountains, there have been melt events that have been so extensive that they've basically changed the way that glaciers look entirely. And uh, this is a little one we, we, we monitored, it's sort of just in from Christchurch, the Rolleston Glacier, and it's how a glacier should look if it's happy. Right, so see it's covered in snow, uh, there's a bit of ice at the bottom, the blue that's sticking out. It's at the end of summer, a glacier like that would rem remain in equilibrium through time. But this is what's happening during the extreme melt years that we've observed recently. Uh, nearly all the snow's gone. So rather than a glacier that's just sort of retreating up the mountain through time, it's having all of its snow stripped off and it's retreating vertically as well as horizontally. And glaciers, um, that they rely on being high in order to attract precipitation and be in a cold environment. So when they get lower, there's a positive feedback and they melt even more. So glaciers thinning, are not, it's not a good thing for, the, for their health. Anyway, let's talk a bit about the impacts. Fox Glacier, it's uh, another one of these you know, iconic glaciers in New Zealand. Uh, and this is a time lapse from 2014. First of all, you can see the mountainside falling down. Yep, so that's happening because the ice is 
is moving backwards and lowering and debuttressing the slope and causing slope instability. Uh, this is an example. This is not hill slope instability. Um, this is a glacier that just decided to collapse almost instantaneously. Um, in, in, this is in the Tian Shan Mountains in, in Kyrgyzstan uh, last year, a video taken by um, a, a British hiker. You've probably seen it. It's had like millions of views on YouTube, right? Um, and people were talking about the avalanche, but this is not a snow avalanche. This is a glacier that was sitting there one moment and then just fell apart the next. And we actually don't understand the processes that could cause this sort of instantaneous ice release, um, but I bet it's linked to extremes like I was talking about before. So if you haven't seen this already, it's pretty spectacular. Everyone asked why didn't he run away and why was he busy filming? But, uh, and I, I stopped it there because it was too big for me to include in this presentation, but um, actually he was on the ridge top and there was nowhere for him to go. And uh, if you haven't seen the video, uh, he ended up just standing behind a rock and the ice avalanche went over the top of him and he survived. Nobody was hurt, but it, it's an incredible um, yeah, sort of a collapse event. And uh, we're seeing these things more and more. Right, I'm switching to Antarctica. The Antarctic ice sheet is larger than Australia, right? it's a huge feature. Uh, on this map on the right, you can see little lines, they're ice flow vectors where the direction the ice is flowing from, you'll, you'll see them moving in, in a minute. Uh, the, the sort of darker gray areas are ice shelves, uh, which is uh, where the ice is floating over the ocean. So let's have a look at what's been happening with Antarctic, you can see the ice flow. Uh, and in West Antarctic, you can see it's starting to go a bit yellow. Um, it's where mass loss is occurring. Um, over here in East Antarctica, this is to the south of us here in Australia. You can see there are areas where it's getting a bit red as well. So it's not just West Antarctica that's changing. Uh, but over here, this is a, a Pine Island Bay, uh, and, and it's the area where there's been the most dramatic change in glacier ice. Uh, Thwaites Glacier is there, so Thwaites sort of is here, and Pine Island, Pine Island Glacier is here. They're the two glaciers in Antarctica that are talked about the most in the media. Uh, Thwaites Glacier is nicknamed the, the Doomsday Glacier. I, I wrote an article about it last year and I called it that and I got in trouble because people say I shouldn't be talking about doom. It's true. Um, they're, just like with mountain glaciers, there are ways of potentially holding this ice at bay with different trajectories of future climate. So it's not all doom and gloom, but still there's certain parts of Antarctica where we're seeing rapid change. And others, like here, the blue parts where there's been a gain uh, this is where a glacier just decided to stop about 100 years ago, and so the ice is building up. It's not being drained off in the same manner. Uh, it just tells you a bit of a story that the flow of ice in Antarctica is complicated. There's all sorts of interesting processes going on. Um, over here, there's been an increase in snowfall, which is why there's been an ice gain. So understanding Antarctica is complicated. I'm just going to show you um, a video of an ice sheet model. This is a projection into the future. So we're about the present day now. Uh, and this is under the worst case warming scenario, uh, and it's demonstrating that marine ice sheet instability process I was just talking about where you can now see West Antarctica disappearing. Uh, and you can also see East Antarctica just over here, also starting to retreat in a couple of places. And like I said before, the, the, what began in West Antarctica at the coast is propagating inwards, and it ultimately results of the entire loss of, of the ice sheet. Uh, this is one model. It's very crude, to be honest. There's lots of problems with it. Um, and, but it's an absolute imperative for us to make models like this of the future that we can fully believe in, where we feel like the processes that are occurring in the models represent those in, in reality. Um, so many things for us to learn still until I feel like uh, we've got simulations like this that we fully trust. That will give us the sea level projections that will make us more informed for you know, is it really, do we really need to cut out emissions? Well, here you can see the impacts. Choose yourself. Yeah, have a think about it. Here's the impact. What do you want to do? Right? It can help answer that question as a society. But if you decide, okay, we're just going to go ahead as normal, um, it gives us the opportunity to think about the engineering that's needed to save the Netherlands or, you know, this, this is the sort of, these are the questions that we need to face as humanity. So this is my last slide. Um, 
I moved to Monash four years ago and uh, we started a group. We were lucky, a, a large group of us in Australia, to set up a special research initiative uh, in Antarctic science called SAFE, uh, Securing Antarctica's Environmental Future. It sits across a whole bunch of different um, institutions. Monash is the lead institution and this is just the ice sheet group, right? So there are people studying uh, the impacts on ecosystems, all sorts of, you know, policy, all sorts of really interesting things that matter to thinking about the future of Antarctica. Um, but we've got a great group who are working on these very problems that I've been talking about tonight. And I hope within a few years we'll be able to, uh, you know, contribute and uh, help understand what's going to happen to the, the glaciers uh, in Antarctica. And I'm also trying to get some work going in the, in the Himalayas too to help uh, understand what's happening to the water resources there. Thank you very much.